really thankful to be here. We sit under great Bible teaching, don't we, under Pastor Joe here at this church? Super blessed. That's a high bar to try and follow if you ever speak at church here. Uh, but it's all about Jesus, isn't it? It isn't about who gives the message. It's about the message itself, and that's Jesus Christ. He's before all things, and I love that we are in the book of John right now. So we're going to go through the Bible, and uh, we're going to see what God is trying to say through the gospel of John. If you're unfamiliar, just let me unpack a little bit where we're at, set up the context, and then we're going to go through about 15 verses, maybe 20 minutes. Then we're going to sing again, and then you'll be on your way to enjoy your Sabbath. So the Gospel of John is one of four Gospels. I've always loved this Gospel, not because it has my name, but because it's a lot more personal. So a, a lot of them tell the story about Jesus, and they were first-hand accounts. But John is the disciple that he says whom Jesus loved. He knew Jesus really well, but he sets up a precedent in that first couple verses of John that are putting Jesus in its rightful place, and that's Jesus as God, as Jesus as the ultimate authority. I think this is the basis of scripture that we need. It's really easy to pay lip service to God in our culture right now. I love God. I follow God. God is a little bit more safe, and a lot of religions aspire to know God. It's one thing altogether to say you know God, and another thing to say Jesus is God. Because there's power in that name, that name Yeshua, Jesus. That's where chains are broken. And Jesus is saying, I am now fully God, fully man. I'm God in flesh to take away the sins of the world. So in John, it starts out, it says, in the beginning was the word, that's logos in Greek, and the word was with God and the word was God. That means Jesus is God. All things were made through him and without him. Not anything made was made that was made. We can say things right now and in our culture and say, well, the Bible never talks about that. Well, Jesus never says anything about this insert controversial issue in our culture. And maybe that's true. He does, Jesus doesn't talk about things that happened 2023 in our culture. He alludes to a lot of them. But the problem is if you don't have Jesus set up as the authority of all scripture, you're wrong in your context. If it says it in Exodus, Jesus said it. If it says it in Obadiah, Jesus said it. If it says it in Psalms, Jesus said it. He has the whole counsel of Scripture. That's all him. All things were made through him and for him. He is God in flesh. So the authority of all Scripture rests in Jesus. So we can trust that if it says somewhere in the Bible that is coming through the messenger of Jesus. I know we have parents in the room. Has anyone ever read the Jesus Storybook Bible to your kids? Anyone in this place? Ever heard of it? Okay, I, I grew up. Uh, in a pastor's home, been around the things of God in the Bible since I was born. Uh, I wasn't really following Jesus very, very well at all when we had our first daughter. She's about 15 now. And I got that Bible. That helped me understand the gospel, the thread of the gospel throughout the Old Testament into the New, better than anything else in the world. So I would encourage you, if you're a parent in this room, grab the Jesus Storybook Bible. That'll open up your faith. That'll help you explain Jesus, how that thread of Jesus is through everything in the Bible. And that's what we need to get before we go into the Bible, that Jesus is everywhere throughout the scriptures. He is the preeminent master of our faith. So we're going to go to verse 35 in John. What happens here is that we see John the baptizer, or John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, just before here has baptized Jesus. That's almost like a coronation into ministry. Jesus is a rabbi, but John baptizes Jesus in front of all of his own disciples, and the Holy Spirit descends as a dove onto Jesus. So the next day after this, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked as Jesus walked by, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed him. Jesus turned, and he saw them following and said to them, what are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and you will see. So they came, and they saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of God. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? 
Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God, you are the king of Israel. Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. So when I read and study the Bible, there's probably a lot of better ways to do it. And I'm sure Joe has a, a form and function of how you are meant to do that when you give a sermon. I just get incredibly curious about why it's in there and who were these people and what's the context and what we can understand. So we're just going to follow some really nerdy rabbit trails and hopefully God can speak through his scriptures. Is that all right? Okay. Who were the disciples? We can think they were just normal dudes, and they were. They were manly men. They were normal dudes, but there's a problem when we think of them in one context. So where the story of John right now is taking place in the region of Galilee in Israel, I should have put a map. That was really dumb of me. So you got a, like a big lake, the Sea of Galilee, and then the Jordan River comes south of it. So Jesus got baptized in the Jordan, then he's traveling north. We can have a perception that this region of Israel was uh, a less learned region, that they were dumber men, less culture, but it's actually the opposite. They were extremely learned men. So in this region of Galilee, it was a major land to sea route. So you'd come from the sea, you'd go through that area, you'd end up through Syria, and you'd go to other places within the world. It was a region of culture. It was a region of knowledge. These people likely spoke multiple languages. Um, and how they viewed the scriptures in the Old Testament was very serious. So you could tell who a rabbi, a teacher was by the men who followed him because uh, when a rabbi discipled men in that time, it wasn't like a once a week Starbucks date where you'd go through a Bible plan on version at all. It was like you would leave your home, you might work a trade, but you would live with this rabbi, you would abide with this rabbi, his behavior and habits would become your behavior and habits, his interpretation of the Torah, the law, and the prophets would become yours, you would emulate this man. So for a Jewish boy in that region, this makes sense. Scripture training begins at five years old. At 10 years old, the oratora and the interpretation. So you can think about the men that Jesus is talking to. Their training in the Old Testament began at five. At 10 years old, they probably have a memorization of the oral Torah, the first five books and the interpretations. At 13, they would travel to the first Passover, and they would probably know the Torah by heart. So if you go back when Jesus goes to the temple in Jerusalem, and they say he's speaking like one who has command over the law— this is what he was doing. After 13, some students learning the law and the prophets, um, they learn a trade and they continue in their studies. Some don't, but it's likely these men did. Exceptional students who continue into adulthood, roundabouts 20, they take on the yoke of a rabbi and they leave home and follow that rabbi. So we know the men were well-versed in scripture. They knew what they were talking about. They had it memorized. They were waiting for a Messiah. That's a rescuer. Why were they waiting? Because the Jewish people were under Roman law. They were subjects of Rome. So the Bible for them ended 400 years prior. And since then, the Israelites had come back from Babylon where they were in exile. They had rebuilt the temple. They were repopulating the land. And then the Ptolemaic kingdoms, Alexander the Great's leftovers ruled over them. And then Rome ruled over them. So they were subjugated. And the whole story of the Old Testament is a story of God's people making this peculiar people holy to him, giving them a law, blessing them, giving them a land, giving them a heritage, and them understanding God's blessing. And like us, they walk away. They see God's favor and they get comfortable and they walk away. And then God says, okay, I'm going to allow you to go through hardship. I'm going to allow people to take you as slaves. I'm going to allow all this stuff to happen so you return to me. And when you return to me, I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to bless you. So they're on this cycle. I can kind of relate to that cycle. For the disciples of John, the first two guys we talk about, they knew the Torah by heart. And you got to understand it. They didn't have Bibles like we have Bibles. They probably had a village scroll. So the law was commanded into their minds and their heart. And I think what we can glean very simply from this passage of scripture is, I'm going to put them down to three things, is that when Jesus calls these men and calls us, he calls us to abide in him because Jesus has the authority to do it because Jesus has supernatural power. He's not just a good teacher. So verse 35, it says, the next day John was standing with two of his disciples and he looked at, looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, behold, the lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and you will see. So they came and they saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. 
John uses intentional language here. He uses the term Lamb of God on purpose. His two disciples, understanding what they understood about the Old Testament, they would have heard him say this, and this would have been fulfillment of a messianic prophecy in their mind. What are lambs for in the Old Testament? Sacrifice. He's, t- he's telling them, hey, you're with me, but this is actually the one you've been waiting for. This is the Lamb of God. He's giving them a dismissal. And what do they do from Jesus? They know that he's now God incarnate. He's the one who comes to rescue. They don't ask him for blessings. They don't ask him for money. They ask to stay with him. The past couple days, uh, I was in me and my wife's homeland, which is Lancaster County, which is only an hour away, but it's a very different world. And we were at a funeral of that patriarch of her family, her great-grandfather. And that's not something to be sad about. He lived an awesome life, was married 70 years, 88 years old, very humble beginnings, has a legacy of generations after him with really healthy marriages who love Jesus and follow him just because of this one man's decision. That's an encouragement to me as a father that there's good data that shows if you make a decision to follow Jesus and live your life following him, five generations after you will be impacted. But where this wraps up in my mind is time. There's a Latin saying called memento mori. Has anyone ever heard it? Memento mori, it's Latin. It says, we all must die. Reflect on your own death. It's a stoic principle. I talked last night. If you've never been to a Saturday night service, it's a little bit more chill. And I said, memento mori. And one jerk in the crowd was like, it's mori. I was like, all right, Latin scholar. (laughs) The Bible talks about this a lot. In Ecclesiastes 7.2, it goes to, It's better to go into the house of mourning than to go into the house of feasting, for this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. These men want time with Jesus. What's the currency in our lives? It's time. If you know what it's like to make money, to lose money, you know that that comes and goes. It's mammon. But you know time never fades away. Or actually, time will fade away. It's finite. When I think about how I use my time sometimes, uh, I get a screen time notification that Apple sends out Sunday mornings. I don't don't know if you get the Sunday morning one. I actually think it's good they do it because it's usually like before church. And I was like, before I was getting ready to preach today, I'm like, such an idiot with my time. I'm like, how do I spend that much time? How many times can you watch people fall down? (laughs) Or get choked out? I I mean, whatever I look at, yeah. it's, It's a sport, so it's not what I'm saying. Yeah. So... These men just want to be with Jesus, and he's given them an opportunity to abide in him. And that's something, I don't know about you, I'm a reluctant abider in the presence of God. That I will fight it, I will claw it, I will search for distraction everywhere I can. I have a phone full of information, and I want to know all the information. You know what? I might be trying to spend time in the Word of God, but I also can figure out what is the highest point in any state in the U.S. That's wild information. You can know the highest point of any state in the U.S. on your phone. That's what overload does to us. But Jesus gives these men and gives us the opposite. The invitation to come and see, that's not a one-time offer. I think for you and I, that's something that we can continually have in him. I just don't take advantage of enough unless I'm up against something. Unless something at work is really stressful or something's going on in my house that isn't right. I'm like, stop. I need your presence, God. I need your peace to flood the situation. And I feel like God says, of course, I love you. You're my son. I'm going to give you that. But I've also been here the whole time. This peace is constant access. Any of you tracking with me on that? In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, he says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And this had me thinking, when was the last time I intentionally let myself abide in Christ? The same presence that these men felt, that's with Jesus' physical presence, but we have the Holy Spirit, our comforter. We have access to God at all times, every time. When was the last time you set down the phone and you made a quiet space in your house and said, God, I, you know, it's 5.30 in the morning, but this is the most important thing I can do today is I can spend time with my father. Insecurity ends when we begin to abide in Christ. We have, uh, for my work, we have a, a number of uh, Christian guys who work there, and we live all across the country. But a lot of times at 8.30 in the morning on a Wednesday, uh, we do like a quick Bible study uh, over teams and kind of talk about what God's doing. And the one guy is real young uh, and... Uh, He said this thing so profound this week. He was like, yeah, I had a friend pray for me. He was going through something. And he said, I I would just pray that I I know how much Christ loves me. And that was the most beautiful thing. We can get heady about things all the time. But the reason Christ gives you the invitation and me the invitation to abide with him 
is because of his great love for us. And maybe you had a father who wasn't like that. And I pray I'm not a father like that. Man, he wants to give you the most precious thing in the world, and that's time. The peace that he offers you and me surpasses all understanding is what his word says. And he's given us the word of God as a hedge of protection. There's a study that came out recently. My dad sent it to me. So uh, we're going to put some data on the screen in a second. But 40,000 people were polled ages 8 to 80 in America to see how people engage with Scripture. It was called Understanding the Bible Engagement Challenge, Scientific Evidence for the Power of Four. As they looked at the results, they made a discovery that shocked them because it wasn't what was originally planned. A study indicated that when people engage in Scripture one time a week, which could include a pastor or someone at your church saying, open your Bibles, there was a negligible effect in some key areas of their life. The same result was true if people engaged in Scripture two times a week. That result equaled little to no effect. But three times a week saw a small indication of life, like lighting a tiny fire. Things got a little better. There was like a faint heartbeat, but something moved in the behavior of the person engaging in Scripture at four times a week. That was the eye-opener. So we talk about abiding in Christ. What does this look like? When day four was reached, the effects spiked in an astounding way and included the following. Let's, if we throw them up on the screen, Jen. This is real data from over 40,000 people. Four times a week in God's presence, abiding in him resulted in feeling lonely dropping 30%. Anger issues dropping 32%. Bitterness in relationships dropping 40%. Alcoholism dropping 57%. Sex outside of marriage drops 68%. Feeling spiritually stagnant. Who's been there? Feeling spiritually stagnant drops 60%. Viewing pornography drops 61%. Sharing your faith jumps 200%. Discipling others jumps 230%. How often are we trying to pour from an empty cup? When God offers us the ability to abide in him through the word that he's given to us. It's not magic. It's not based on your feelings. God is offering us to abide in his presence because of his great love for you and his great love for I. Come and see. That data was shocking to me. Not so much. You know, I've gone through seasons of my life where I've uh, spent time in God's presence more and spent time in God's presence less. But for the most part, it's been a, been a pretty consistent habit. But I notice the times that I'm saying, God, I'm going to be quiet. I want to hear from you. I want to be in your word. Just the changes in atmosphere that he's done to my home is unreal. Man, and it's not that he makes life easier. You know, I think some of the most chaotic times in life are times when I'm trying to spend in God's word, some of the most challenging and frustrating times, just seasons of life. But that peace that passes all understanding is real, and that's what these disciples are seeing. The reason Jesus is able to say this with confidence, because Jesus has the authority to do so. John called him the Lamb of God, because lambs are for the sacrifice. If we go back to the Old Testament, to Exodus, that lamb concept is right there. Because as the Jews were trying to leave Egypt, Pharaoh said no, his heart was hardened, and plagues would come, and plagues would come, and Moses would say what? Let my people go. So finally, the last time God said, hey, watch out. Here's what's going to happen. The angel of death is going to pass over these homes, and the firstborn male of the household is going to die unless you slaughter a lamb and you pour its blood over its doorpost. That's a brutal plague. We make God a little bit too safe. In our liking. He is not safe. He's good, but he's not safe. So the blood was over the door of that spotless lamb. And for the Israelites, they were able to pass through and they were able to leave the land of Egypt. But that's foreshadowing of the gospel of the lamb who was willingly slain in our place for our sins. But Jesus isn't that one thing all the time. He's also the lion. There's over 300 specific prophecies. These men knew. They knew the Old Testament. They knew the prophecies about the one to come to save Israel and save the world. There was over 300 specific prophecies about who this man would be that Jesus, one man who is God, wrapped up. That's mathematically impossible. I love logic. I love arguing things of the faith. This right here is like the nail in the coffin. Jesus is the authority over all life and death. That same Jesus who is the lamb, who is willingly walking to the cross in your place for your sins, is the same Jesus who was in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's that same man. That's the proto-evangelion. Jesus is the one who after resurrection says all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. 
Jesus is the one that at the last days will come back riding a white horse with a sword out of his mouth and a tattoo on his leg. Jesus is the one that when Stephen is getting stoned and Apostle Paul is Saul then holding the coats, who is sitting at the right hand of God, that position of authority, Stephen looks up and sees him, and what is Jesus doing? He's standing. He is not meek and mild. He is laying down himself willingly in our place for our sins. And what John is saying is, this is the one you need to follow, and he has the authority. So verse 43, it says this. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. We've seen Jesus gather his first two disciples and have them follow him. And Jesus is known, they call him a rabbi, a teacher. And this goes back to Jesus' authority. In that day, there was two kinds of rabbis. There is one who just knew the scripture and the law and the prophets and would explain them to the people. There was another kind of rabbi who spoke with true authority and could use metaphors and parables and relate those things to cultures so they could pull out the deeper meanings behind scripture. A lot of times when you read the Bible and I read the Bible, we can see things right at face value, but the Bible is a multifaceted, multifaceted, multidimensional <laughs> message from God. So Jesus could pull out those meanings and in that day, those teachings of a rabbi like that who taught with authority, that was called the rabbi's yoke. That was something he would place upon people. Some rabbis had a heavy yoke. If you understand Jewish culture, you know, very religious Jews would put the phylacteries on their heads and their tassels low, and they went through all kinds of religious behavior. And they added onto the Old Testament law with extra laws and extra laws and extra laws. Like you couldn't get holier than these guys. And Jesus says this in Matthew 11. He gives that authority. He said, all things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone whom the Son chooses to reveal Reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He's not only telling that these men that they need to follow him, to leave everything, he's confirming that he's the one that they've been waiting for. And he's saying to them and to us, stop. Stop the relentless pursuit of anything else beside me. There's no peace in that. It's also good to note that it doesn't take these men a ton of convincing or clever marketing or high-level production to bring people to Jesus. They have a real experience with the maker of heaven and earth, and they just say, come and see. We can co-op that a lot and be like, come and see church. Come and see this production. Come and see this speaker. Come and listen to this podcast. Come listen to this Christian band. God can use all those things, and that's fine, but that's not Jesus. The best witness you're going to have is an authentic experience with Jesus where you can just say, hey, come and see. Jesus has changed my life in this way. That's a story that you need to be able to tell. And if you haven't, Jesus offers it to you. And the last thing we want to wrap up with, and band, you can come up and uh, do what worship bands do and play ambient behind. <laughs> kind of, that's what I normally do. <laughs> just, just light enough. <laughs> I'll tell you what chords. Just go to G to E minor. E minor the fourth time through. All right. <laughs> Jesus has supernatural power. He's God. Verse 47 says this. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said, Behold an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. We don't know much about Nathaniel. He's also known as Bartholomew. Those are just different alliterations of the same guy who he's a son of and things like that. We know that he was a religious Jew. We know he knew the Old Testament, and they appealed to his knowledge of Moses and the law and the prophets and just said, come and see. But church tradition tells us a little bit more about who this man was. So normal guy, followed a rabbi was with Jesus and his ministry on earth, saw all kinds of miracles. Jesus promises that you're going to see greater things than these. So he sees Jesus heal people, feed the 5,000, uh, be crucified, resurrect in glory and power, then do all kinds of miracles for the time that he's on earth and ascend to heaven. You take these men who saw this, and some of them denied Christ. To after they saw him rise again, 
they went and spread the gospel around the earth and every one of them was martyred except for John. Now John was boiled and he was sent to an island which he, he got us revelation. That doesn't sound awesome though. Everyone else was martyred and the way this man was martyred, church tradition tells us, is that uh, after leaving the land of Israel, he went east. He went through Persia, spread the gospel there, started churches. He went into India. If you look at that kind of western coast of India, there's a pocket of Christians there that claim their lineage is from Nathaniel. Then he went back up to the region of the Caucasus in Armenia. Armenia is known as the first Christian nation. It still is. Uh, it's north of Iran, uh, kind of east of Turkey, where the mountains of Ararat are. And there's a lot of Christians still in that nation because they've been so since the time of this man. And what he did is that he took that gospel of Jesus Christ. Someone said, come and see. And he took that to the king of Armenia. And the king of Armenia converted, but the king's brother who wanted power didn't like that. So the king's brother took Nathaniel, this man who knew Jesus, and he skinned him alive. He flayed him. And he left him alive like that until he could breathe no more. And then he cut off his head and he crucified him in front of people there. And then his relics were scattered and history doesn't tell us much else about this man. It's easy to make Jesus a wise teacher. You don't have men who meet death like this for a wise teacher. There's been thousands of them throughout history. Buddha, everybody else, maybe a wise teacher. Jesus was God. You don't have someone who fulfills over 300 prophecies, mathematically impossible in Scripture, fulfill them all in one and say, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. He is that one. He is God. He has a supernatural authority to make these proclamations about himself. He's Nathaniel before Nathaniel knows it. So what I see from that, if you go down to like a little nerd rabbit trail with me, is that he is a being who exists out of our space and time. We live in a linear time. We have entropy. The author of all creation is not affected by that, able to peer outside of it. If we look at prophecies in the Old Testament, God is giving them a glimpse. Hey, come to my perspective. I'm outside of time and space. Sometimes it's veiled. Sometimes it's not veiled. Sometimes it's full of metaphors. Sometimes it isn't. When we talk about the fear of God and the dread of the one, that isn't like fear of retribution or punishment. What that is, is that is in awe and wonder of his majesty and his glory. And a being like that is worthy of our worship, is he not? He is worthy of our fidelity. He is worthy of our submission. He was telling Nathaniel, I see you. And there's comfort in that. Not only that he has a supernatural ability to see him, but practically for you and I, he sees us. In Psalm, it says that he knows our frame. And Jesus does. That's why he is, that's why he's a man. He felt everything we feel. He sees us and he sees our sins, past, present, and future. And he still chooses to go to the cross. And I believe he goes to the cross and he knows each one of us by name. We're in his eyes and he says, no matter what, John, I take this pain for you because I love you. Insert your name there. These men who followed him, some who denied him, once they saw him rise in power, they willingly gave their lives unto death because they trusted him. I think some of us, me, need to recognize Jesus for who he is and stop making him so safe in our comprehension. He doesn't force himself on us. He gives us a choice. But he's bending the fabric of time and space just to show you his love and his kindness and giving you the opportunity to abide in him because that's where peace rests. Could we bow our head and close our eyes? Father God, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And for every soul in this room, we invite the Holy Spirit into this place. Father, we need you. We need an understanding of your power. Your word says, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. And you're worthy of all glory and honor and praise. I pray peace over everyone in this room. If you're watching, I want peace over you right now. I pray that each of us will carve out time in our day to abide in you and understand your great love. And you would empower us to do great things according to your word, according to your glory, God. In Jesus' good name, amen.